how can we meet the needs of our diverse uh, student populations? And that's what we're here to talk about with you today. We have a couple of students that are joining us. We have Jonathan joining us remotely as we are looking at hybrid models and, and remote learning and in-person learning. And then we have Danica and we have Josh. So I have a series of questions I'm gonna ask the students from their perspective on their learning experience through the pandemic. Uh, and I will start with question number one. And it is, Danica, please tell us a little bit about yourself. Okay. Um, so Sigali, my name is Danica Pierce. Um, I'm from London, Ontario, um, from the Oneida Nation, but I lived, uh, grew up in London. Um, currently, I live about three hours, like, um, south of Toronto with my mom, but I'm living in Toronto for school right now. I go to George Brown in my first year at, for graphic design, just at the Daniels building over there. Um, so yeah, that's a bit about me. Um, I'm 20, so I took a couple years off before I went back for post-secondary, um, but now I'm at George Brown for my first year. Amazing. Thank you so much, Danica. So we have learners in all stages of learning, and next I will ask you, Jonathan, to introduce yourself to the test conference. Me, Gwach, Audrey, Manog, uh, Gat, everyone. Ani, Bojo, Kuwait and Nimki and Dishnakaz, Miswagi and Donjaba, Ketaganzi, B Minwa, Wabashi Shikan Dodam. Good afternoon, everyone. It is a, it's a huge honor and pleasure to be uh, virtually here with you. Uh, it sounds like a really good crowd, and uh, I hope everyone's keeping warm in the, in the Toronto area. Um, I am joining you today from um, my home community, uh, which is known as Bao Ting, um, also known as Sault Ste. Marie. Um, I am on a border city here. My traditional name is Northern Thunder. Uh, I am part of the Martin clan, and um, I am just so uh, thrilled to, to be here with everyone today and share a little bit of my experience. So welcome, and uh, I am coming to you from the Robinson Huron Treaty Territory. Gwetch. Miigwech. Miigwech, Jonathan. And Josh, tell us a little bit about yourself. Absolutely. Um, so I, my name is Joshua. I'm also from London, Ontario. I'm um, born and raised. I've been in Toronto for about five years. Um, I'm a recent graduate of the practical nursing program at George Brown. My hope is to become a nurse practitioner later down the road. Um, my family originally comes from the East Coast, as well as um, the Naperville region outside of Quebec, or Montreal, I should say. And um, I primarily, I'm working now at George Brown uh, with the Indigenous Mentorship Program, which we're launch launching in January. Um, but I also work in harm reduction. Um, so that's a little bit about me. Thank you. Amazing. Thank you guys so much for sharing a little bit about yourself. Uh, going through uh, post-secondary education in a pandemic, we're going to talk about that a little bit. So Jonathan, I'm going to ask you the first question. And the first question is for you to tell us about your learning experience during and post-pandemic. So take us through a little bit of that learning experience, please. Yeah, no, thank you so much for, for that question. Um, this question has been asked uh, numerous of times as a, as a post, uh, post-grad student, I guess. Um, it, for me, um, going through post-secondary when we were face-to-face -face and in, I guess, face-to-face uh, -face classrooms, um, moving over into uh, university, it was into the hybrid model and then fully remote. Um, I feel that during my time as a, as a college student, when I was face-to-face, -face, I still already had my own struggles, my own learning um, difficulties um, as, it, as it was. So when moving over into the hybrid or remote model, uh, it just became that much more uh, difficult. And in terms of my own like confidence, it just it, it lowered it. And I didn't feel that I was attaining as much knowledge as I should have been. Um, even in the program itself, uh, although I felt confident with the information coming to me, uh, I just, I wanted to ensure that I was able to articulate it and, and respond back to, to that knowledge, um, essentially just because it, it goes hand in hand in the, the current work that I do today outside of school. 
Um, so it was absolutely um, challenging in the perspective of being at home. Uh, I am a father of twins. I have a little boy and girl who is uh, four years old, uh, who's actually homesick right now. Um, and, and just given that, you know, you're talking about my particular program, uh, it was the Bachelor of Indigenous Social Work. Uh, so some of the topics that you're, you're reading on or, or learning about uh, could be heavy and um, trying to relate that with real life experiences in your responses to some of the assessments or assignments uh, given to you, you really got to dig deep into, into self and really reflect on, on how you're meaningfully going to answer some of those questions being presented to us. And thinking like this is this is supposed to be my safe spot, you know, a safe place as my family, uh, for my kids, uh, for my wife, uh, for myself, and I'm bringing in a lot of that that trauma, um, trauma related experiences, not only for me as an indigenous person, uh, but thinking about the communities that I work with and work for, uh, hearing some of their experiences. Um, all of those coming into mind while I'm reviewing those responses and, and writing out my response for the assignment and thinking, you know, this really isn't, um, we have to do what we have to do, but this really isn't fair to us as individuals, as learners to bring in that, that heaviness into our home. Um, so that I think was a, a huge challenge for myself um, on top of trying to balance uh, being a father and, and trying to provide for the family as well. So I think that's what I have to offer for this question. Miigwech. Wow, I, I think that's really important for us to think about as your audience is when we bring things home and we are all working uh, in spaces too where we're bringing our work home and how do we uh, create that safe place in our in our home environments where we do have children and uh, family members there. So thank you, Jonathan, for sharing that. I will ask you, Josh, the same thing. Tell us a little bit about that experience uh, pre, uh, I know you're, you've graduated now, but when you were uh, learning through the pandemic. Definitely. Yeah, so when I started the nursing program, you know, it was in person and nursing is difficult to say the least. Um, you know, as a first generation student as well, um, that is a challenge in itself. And so once the pandemic hit, um, you're faced with a lot of choices. So I left Toronto and moved back to London. And uh, that in itself is difficult because you're going back to maybe an environment that you're not necessarily the most happy with. Um, it's still home though, um, and you're just working in a setting that has a lot of barriers in place, uh, technologically, um, safety, um, space, like physical space itself. And so learning on um, a completely remote model, especially in nursing, was extremely difficult. Um, I found myself like working in the garage to submit videos on, you know, nursing skills um, off an iPad, which doesn't sound the hardest, but it is quite tricky. Um, and then going forward, you know, I was looking after my grandmother um, and my grandfather who passed. And so caregiving on top of nursing school, living remotely in a city, pure isolation. It was, it was very, very difficult. Um, and I'm very thankful to the faculty at the nursing school here at George Brown um, for basically saying, please come back and finish your, your diploma because um, we need nurses. So I was able to come back and do that through a more hybrid model, which was also isolating coming back to Toronto. You know, people have moved away. Um, so that, that was difficult as well. But, um, you know, my preceptor and my clinical advisor, they were very, um, they're great mentors. Uh, so it wasn't a negative experience overall. It was a positive one, but there were a lot of challenges that were involved with it. Um, and but I'm happy to be back in Toronto and you know doing doing the work in community. Um, I think that's really the only important work is community work. Uh, but yeah, uh, it it was an interesting um, it was an interesting amount of uh, challenges that were involved. Yeah. I think we, we all have different roles in, in the sector and education and just listening to you, it's so important what each one of us does and the experience that we are able to either assist students with 
think about what are they going through when they're learning with us and and having those supports are so important and uh, we're all we're all juggling that same stuff as well um, as uh, the front line trying to support students so Danica I'll ask you the same question I know you're new with us but you did just move from London and tell us a little bit about your uh, post-secondary experience yeah so um I graduated high school in 2020, which is when everything kind of grinded to a halt. So I didn't get to finish my last year in a way that I think would have set me up for more success in post-secondary. Um, I didn't know what I wanted to do or where I wanted to go. So I ended up after everything kind of grinded to a halt, went back for part of a 13th year to just do some classes and get back into the swing of actually doing like school and putting myself in the mindset of going to class and putting assignments in because I felt I wasn't ready after having so many months off of being stagnant um, and I like to move around I like to always be doing things so I had lots of things in the air and they just all kind of shut down so quickly and so I was really lost in what I wanted to do and where I saw myself um, so then I finally decided on college and in my program and I applied and I got accepted to a different school than George Brown. Um, but I found out about a month before my program was to start that they had moved it completely online. And I also, through circumstances, when ab was a able to live on residence, so I had to stay home. So I'm over about three hours away, fully online. And it was just really difficult for me to get momentum to get going into this entirely new program. I didn't know anyone in my class. I didn't know any of my professors or what their intentions were. And so it was really hard for me to keep on track and keep focused on my studies. Um, yeah, because I, I really like to be in an environment with people because that really keeps me going and keeps me focused on what I'm doing. So. I like to do my schoolwork where there's people on my campus after school. When I'm at home by myself, um, I just live with my mom. So when she's at work, um, no one is in the house. So it's, there's no one there to really keep me motivated and keep me in check. And um, I really struggled a lot with um, my depression got really bad after the um, COVID really hit. Um, I had just kind of been distracting myself over the years with things to do and places to go. And once things shut down, obviously there was nothing to keep me distracted that way. So I unfortunately didn't finish my first year of graphic design successfully at that institution. Um, and I didn't know what to do. I kept a couple months in the winter. What should I do? Should I take another year off? And so I ended up applying again for the same program at George Brown, which I got in and I'm doing now, um, which is great because um, it's fully in person. All of my classes are with students. So I really have a community again and I'm finding my way and doing the things that I enjoy doing. But yeah, it was definitely a struggle going from just being in that mindset to totally being thrown off track and not being able to pull myself back without like physical supports in front of me because it's it requires so much more mental capacity to actually reach out digitally to people to be like, hey, I need help. I'm struggling with this. I don't understand. It's a lot harder to write that email and send it and track down the people that you need to get a handle on for helping with that. Um, and I just, my pride didn't allow me to <laughs> find those people in time, unfortunately, so yeah. Thank you so much. I, that that was really um, loaded. You know, thinking about what what do we what do we do and what are we here for, and uh, how can we serve people and learners through these challenges. So this is all really really helpful. I hope that um, you know this is having the, the impact on the audience as well. I'm going to ask a question. We're going to talk a little bit about barriers, and then we're going to talk about some opportunities. So I only have a couple more questions, but let's dig a little bit deeper into some of those barriers because we went virtual um, quite fast, a little unprepared. I know we've been dabbling in doing that uh, as a sector for a really really long time, but we just sort of went right into it. Um, what were some of those practical barriers that this room that you would like this room to hear when it came to uh first of all maybe going 100 percent virtual and now 
working in these hybrid spaces. So I'm going to go back to you, Jonathan, if you could just uh, give uh, the room uh, an idea of some of the barriers of learning uh, virtually and in hybrid models. No, absolutely. Thank you so much. Um, this is such a, another, I guess, loaded question, if you will, um, Audrey, just because us as Indigenous learners are already coming with numerous of barriers attached to us. Um, whether you come from a Northern community, remote Northern community, or just um, one of your First Nations in general, we know the experiences and traumas that we carry as Indigenous learners uh, and as Indigenous people. So to have those um, knowing barriers walking into post-secondary and when the world shut down and we were forced to go back into our communities or go back to our home or go back to residence um, and not have that sense of community you know we heard it from from our other panelists the the importance of community we are a communal people so when we were all forced to go back home and learn individually we already lean on our peers a lot in our in our programs i know i did i leaned on them a lot just for that social aspect for that that awareness and then almost that validation that i'm doing the right thing that i'm there that i'm learning the right stuff that i'm responding accurately but for me it just i kept thinking in my mind you know as march happened we were all forced you know to to be at home and then moving into april may june july and thinking okay well this 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 is going to be like this for, for quite some time, so I need to learn how to adjust. And all I kept thinking about for myself was, you know, I, I, I am an urban Indigenous person. I say that because I'm next, uh, I live in the city here in Sault Ste. Marie, if it's considered a city. Um, however, I do consider myself very privileged in the fact that I'm not, you know, some of my relatives that are in northern um, northern communities that don't have sufficient access to Wi-Fi, don't, don't have sufficient access to technology. And, you know, we hear a lot of our elementary schools and, uh, and our high schools providing technology for their students so that they can learn. But for me, I felt that there was inadequate, um, inadequate uh, resource um, for our Indigenous learners I was in post-secondary. From a lessons learned perspective, I think we really need to do better as a sector in terms of supporting our Indigenous learners, all learners, of course, but in particular Indigenous learners, because we already know we come with uh, those uh, face barriers. So for me, I think it was um, learn how to adapt, getting very uncomfortable uh, and asking for that help. Um, and really just trying to maneuver it the best way that I possibly could. Um, and I was often told this, you know, being an Indigenous learner, going through post-secondary, Josh, I love how you said that you're a first-generation learner. I too am first-generation, first one out of my family to one, graduate high school, two, be accepted and go to college and complete college and now into university. Um, first out of my family so I never had anybody to lean on in terms of calling mom and saying mom I'm really struggling right now I don't know you know how to access this or go here you usually I can go to the library and the library would help me with you know finding those resources or helping me research and, and do my work but you weren't allowed to go anymore um, and being a shy uh, individual as it is you know I wasn't going to take those risks and, and reaching out um, so it absolutely forced me to grow as an individual and I'm very proud of that. Um, but on the flip side, I was also thinking of my, you know, my, my relatives that aren't as outspoken or aren't as confident um, that really just, you know, we, we often hear about falling through the cracks. Our learners are falling through the cracks. And I, I wholeheartedly believe that a lot of our learners did fall through the cracks in these past two years. And we're really seeing it now in terms of trying to get caught back up into to where we're supposed to be in terms of our academics and, and making that progress. Um, I guess just one reminder is just be easy on yourself and, and we'll get through this together. But uh, um, it was definitely uneasy and uncomfortable maneuvering that process. Uh, however, you know, we are sitting here today and, uh, you know, some progress was made. So let's uh, let's remember those pieces. Miigwech. 
Miigwech, yes. I think, you, you, you know, you're really talking about people that did fall through the cracks. We have three learners here that um, didn't, but there are a lot of learners that we need to do some extra work and say, how do we get them back into the programs? How do we get them back into the institutions? And what are some of the things that we need to do to make that a better environment? So Josh, I'm going to ask you the same question. If you could just share some of the barriers. Uh, mm -hmm. I know you talked a little bit about that um, and you guys both also living outside of the city and then returning uh, into uh, the city. So I'll just pass yeah. it to you. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, I really like what, um, you know, was said earlier. Uh, you know, I think we, we can talk about the technological barriers that exist um, with remote learning. Um, those are pretty easy fixes as far as I can, oh, pardon me, as far as I can see. Um, but, you know, when it comes to the mental health, that's really where um, people struggle, and especially Indigenous people, um, you know, for transparency, you know, you know, I'm, most of my identity is white, but I do have um, ancestral roots, so I am proud of that, and I'm very privileged because of that, um, but with that, even I feel the effects of colonization, right, um, I think that in itself is um, probably the biggest thing, really, I mean, I don't know how everyone interprets the world around them in this room, but when we have things in the news about our children, when we have things in the news about our communities, when we look out on the landscape and see the scars of urbanization, all of this, all of these things, it's almost like living in the apocalypse. And so I think that's really important to remember is that for Indigenous students, on top of, um, just the technical side of things, they're also dealing with um, a world that is not necessarily normal to them. Um, so it, 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 I think it really comes down to um, kind of the isolation that Indigenous people feel and the trauma that um, has been inflicted on communities. So, yeah. I, it seems like time, you know, is, is just been going really, really, at its own pace through the pandemic, but you did talk about something really important. And we know that through the news, there has been quite a lot of damaging news stories for indigenous peoples across Canada. And it started with the, um, you know, the discovery of the graves in, in Vancouver, and then it went all across Canada, went through all of our provinces. And now there are searches in Ontario that are happening right now. So this news uh, is not old news. This is something that's happening in communities right now. And having those affect you as a learner as well, Josh, on top of the the other barriers of how do I get online and where am I learning and am I in the garage and you know how am I actually going through this uh, learning experience uh, I think that's a good thing to share with this audience is those those things when they happen and we see violence against indigenous peoples and we look at the east coast and the treaty rights that were challenged mm -hmm. there and and all the things that have happened to be mindful of the the actual world the, the world and what's going on in Canada so thank you so much for sharing that Josh and Danica I'll ask you the same question some of the barriers Barriers. Um, yeah, so again, I was fortunate enough to not have barriers in the sense of tech. I, I had Wi Fi, I had a laptop that worked that I could plug in and get to my classes that way. But yeah, definitely like the mental, psychological aspect of bringing myself to class enough to absorb what I'm learning and put it back on the paper or put it back in my project. Um, yeah, I just felt like I didn't have the support to do that. And so, um, yeah, definitely as like an indigenous learner as well, um, where I live currently, it's so small, it's considered a village actually. And um, I could probably count on one hand how many people live there that look like me or other minorities. Um, so yeah, I definitely didn't have the support in that sense for the world events that were happening around me. I didn't really have a lot of things to reach out to be like, hey, you know, this is bothering me. Let's talk about it. Let's sit down and kind of go through or just to have someone silently, you know, you don't have to dissect it, but just to be there and understand. Um, not a lot going on there again with my friend group in the town as well. They're great and they're fantastic, but they're they're dealing with their own things and they just don't have the same background. And so they 
might not always put their emphasis on how I'm feeling with the certain things that are going on, which is totally understandable. We're all doing our own thing and trying to get through this. Um, but yeah, other than my mom, I didn't really have anyone to kind of sit down and go through any of those emotions or feelings with. So, you know, they can build up and there's nowhere to put them. Um, so they kind of just eat away and, you know, it does tack on to the daily things of what you're doing to try to get back into the swing of things, get back into living and doing the things, um, schoolwork, regular work, attending your classes on top of all that. It can definitely like take a large toll that I think, I mean, it's no one's fault that they didn't um, see that. Um, but it is something that, you know, you just deal with every day, so. So we're gonna, we're gonna, we only have uh, one more question for our panelists and, and I just wanna change, change the lens here a little bit. I'm gonna ask each one of you in the room full of people that are able to make programs and make resources and have supports available for you, what will it take? What will it take for us in this sector to create a conducive learning environment for indigenous learners? I'm hearing so far, I've heard the connection, the community, these things are really important. So let, let's, I'm gonna ask you, Jonathan, first, if what, what is needed here? What can, what can be, what could you hope for the next generation of learners now that you've graduated in this, uh, you know, still sort of post pandemic, not really, uh, you know, I know some people say we're not over it, so don't say post, but we're still in this hybrid learning model. So what can you uh, share with the room, Jonathan, as far as what, what can be uh, provided? Yeah, absolutely. Um, really great question, uh, this one. Um, so the two part of it all, first part, um, what could the sector do to uh, support hybrid learning for Indigenous learners is talking, talking with us, uh, asking us directly what the, those resources are. Um, we can put out numerous of surveys. We could, you know, connect with various of colleagues in various sectors and, and what they're doing. But if we're not actually addressing the actual learner themselves and seeing what they need to be successful, we are always going to miss our targets. You know, we're going to put substantial investment into a particular area that may not be sufficient or supportive uh, for that learner. So I just want to caution our, our sector in terms of uh, maybe best practice two years ago um, was, you know, reaching out to colleagues and, and seeing what other people were doing in terms of their best practices. But what we've learned through this pandemic was that doesn't work and it's not always uh, supportive for our learners. So I would absolutely encourage uh, most of our post-secondaries and in the college sector have uh, Indigenous student councils or Native student councils or student government uh, bodies as an individual who um, loves student government. Um, we're always available to talk. And if we don't have the answers, we have a huge network that we could tap into with that our actual learners going through uh, some of these challenges every single day and what their experiences are like currently actively like as a hybrid learner. So that is the one piece. The second piece really to enhance it, to make a, a meaningful experience for our learners is, I think this is a, the way that our world is going to, to go into and continue to support. and do I believe the hybrid aspect is, is a negative thing? Absolutely not. Uh, and the reason is we are living in such a fast paced world that not only do we need to provide for ourselves, our families, if we have you know small kids at home, um, a wife and, and, and life uh, building upon that, but we also wanna build ourselves up professionally. And how can we do that while still living in this, in this world that, uh, I don't know if it's uh, keeping up with the Joneses or just trying to have all the wonderful things that life is presenting to you. Um, but it does take work. It does take a lot of effort. Uh, so we must, whether it's having a part-time or a full-time job uh, to support the means that we want to have or support the lifestyle that we want to have um, and break those generational cycles that we often, many of us were, were brought up in. I know that is one of my biggest prize is, you know, being able to own my own home um, and, and have those, whether it's material things, it's it's something that my kids could be proud of and they don't have to endure. Um, so it's being mindful that our learners are going to be working extra hard um, 
one to be in, in, in that program, but two, to support that the life that they want to have. Um, and really, I guess for, for the overall sector to support the, the learners is continuing to offer those spaces because we've heard uh, from the other panelists, uh, along with myself, that yes, we are a very communal people. Um, if they can try and uh, support maybe more of a communal environment over virtual means, we, we know that it's accessible, we know that it works, you know, there's um, even, uh, and I'm, I hope it's not too way off topic, but in terms of TikTok, TikTok has a wonderful algorithm where they make sure that you're connected with the people that your interests are in, um, similar to like native TikTok and your, your, all of your videos are coming in. Um, so I, I say that because, you know, maybe there's opportunity for the institution themselves uh, to, to have more of like a group chat for Indigenous learners or people within a particular program uh, to have that social network um, outside of the class more outside of the, the um, course material. Because um, essentially it's a, it's a wonderful uh, journey going through post-secondary. Um, we are all doing it for a purpose. We're all doing it to give back in some capacity uh, and to ensure that our next seven generations don't have to endure what we have to endure or our ancestors had to endure. Um, so I'm very proud to be here um, to give my insight, my experience, and, and some of my recommendations to the sector and to our learners and to all of the individuals in the room. Um, and thank you for allowing me to, to share my experience now. Thank you so much. And I, I love me some TikToks. <laughs> um, I, I, I heard two things there, uh, employment. This is why people are in our sector. They want to get into the industry, industry partners, partnerships, employment, and understanding that a lot of Indigenous learners are currently employed. Uh, so they're also learning, but they're working as well and being able to create those connections, uh, having connections uh, as whenever we can to have events or create community. But I love the idea of some type of a virtual community, kind of like a, like a TikTok feed. I really like that. Thank you so much for sharing that. So I will ask you too, Josh, uh, tell us, uh, tell the room what you think uh, can improve the post-secondary experience yeah. for Indigenous learners. Definitely. Yeah, and if you're not on native TikTok, get on it because it's hilarious. <laughs> you may not get the comedy at first, but you will. Um, so for what, you know, what this industry can do for Indigenous learners, you know, um, well, firstly, what we do for all learners, you know, um, but it goes beyond that, as we've heard, um, holding space for those learners um, and being accommodating. Um, just for an example, you know, when I, when I went to the University of Ottawa, um, my father had a heart attack and I missed a couple of classes and I got slack for it from the prof. And like, that was me before I even identified as indigenous, right? So I'm, what I'm trying to say is it's not a big deal if someone misses a class. I don't know what everyone's role here is in the education industry, but my point being is relax a little bit, you know, like, <laughs> no, seriously. Um, I, I, <laughs> You know, if it's one thing we learned from the pandemic is that uh, the, the way I look at it too is um, we live in a colonial society and a colonial system. And what we got from the pandemic was a taste of what could be, you know, um, not rigid schedules, not um, hard deadlines, things like this. And I know there are other factors that I don't know anything about, but that's the one thing. Uh, the other thing I would say, you know, especially if you are a settler, is understanding your role as a treaty person. Um, you know, when you live here in the dish with one spoon, you're a part of a covenant, you're a part, you have responsibilities. Um, and you should take joy in that responsibility because uh, not just Indigenous people, but all people are communal people. We are a community. Um, and it should bring you joy to take care of others. Um, it's not a burden. It's it's responsibility and, and it should bring you joy to do so because what that leads to is the ability to have cultural exchange. You know, you can come to the powwows. You, I mean, you can come anyway, but my point being is it, it gives you a more rounded experience of the human experience. So um, I, I would say hold space and just understanding your responsibility as a treaty person. 
That's amazing. Thank you so much. I, I, we are uh, on this beautiful territory of our treaty partners, the Mississaugas, and uh, there is so much. I love that cultural exchange. That's yeah. a that's a beautiful way to put it. Thank you, Josh. So, Danica, we will leave it with you. What <laughs> could you share with the room? What what could we focus on? Maybe take away, make it an awesome experience. Yeah, um, I think the biggest thing that I have come across that I think needs to be addressed is in high school and post-secondary, whether it's university or college, I find a lot of people, my friends, students are always so concerned with their grades and how they're doing and what their average is. And when I look at it, I don't really feel like they're absorbing a lot of what they're actually learning. They just learn it and retain it for a month or two, spit it out and then start absorbing the next thing. And I think um, shifting your mindset to looking on how to improve like the lives of people once they leave this institution, mm -hmm. because um, you're only there for you know two to four years, maybe a little longer, and then you're doing life. And if you don't actually absorb the things that you need to succeed in life further, it's really like you put yourself through all this stress for really no benefit other than a piece of paper. Um, so I think a lot of people higher up need to think about how students are absorbing things and how they're connecting and how they're taking these things um, with their life and how they can succeed beyond. Um, because the mindset right now with a lot of people that I interact with is just, what is my grade? How am I doing? Am I gonna retain this? you know, scholarship, if I don't keep my grade up, am I going to stay in sports? If I don't keep my grade up, am I going to get kicked out? So really just focusing on every aspect of making like a wholesome life and being successful is not just about the numbers that you see like in your grade book. Um, so I think that's the shift that needs to be made a little. Oh my goodness. I was going to say something really, but I'm not going to, I'm not going to crack that <laughs> joke. That was a serious moment. I think, you know, A's, A's all around, right? It, it, it grades really do affect people. And there are so many things that are going on, Jonathan, as you said, and uh, even from knowing you, I didn't even know that you had twins at home and what a beautiful thing. And a lot of people, you know, are trying to learn and work with uh, having uh, little ones, little ones at home. So, um, you know, I, I like that we do put a lot of emphasis on that, but let's work on some practical skills too. Let's try to make really good, uh, make a positive experience for people so that, that when they do get out into industry, that they are making a positive experience. And it wasn't just all looking back at getting that paper, paper, but something a little more rounded. So I just want to thank everyone, uh, our panelists for joining us and sharing this story with us, uh, taking the time away from their classes or uh, some post post classes and sharing their stories with this uh, conference. I want to thank Tess for having us here today. And I hope that you were able to, um, you know, uh, think, think a little bit about it, uh, some of the stories that were shared. But before we end, we do have a couple of uh, opportunities for a couple questions. So if anybody has any questions for any of the students that came here today, uh, please let us know. We can walk around a mic and we will take a few questions at this time. Okay. Thank you. Can Do you think you can project or do you want me to bring the mic? Okay. Pardon? <laughs> oh, yeah. If you could just uh, introduce yourself. Hi, I'm Jenny Heyman. I'm at Conestoga College. Uh, and thank you all so much for your stories and for sharing your experiences. So uh, my question is, a little, it's, I hope it's not super complicated. So as institutions, we, um, we have grown and supported Indigenous student services with, with all kinds of really great name, renaming happening, which is great. But those, it seems to me that those are buffers between colonial systems, which the schools definitely are, uh, and that we're, that the Indigenous Student Services, which is a really 
difficult job, have to always ask for exceptions to our policies, to our processes, rather than just taking those barriers away. So I'm curious to know uh, if anyone wants to share a, a particular policy or a process that got in their way and what we could do just to generally fix our systems rather than requiring that buffer. That's a really good question. I, I know I know some of the barriers that you have both faced, um, but I don't know who wants to take, who would like to respond? I'm more than happy to. Okay. Um, so I can't speak directly about George Brown College, um, but I'll speak from my perspective as a harm reduction worker uh, through Wigwamanon, which was ran by Losa Healing Service in London, Ontario, part of the Giwe uh, Tashkan program, which is bringing people home. Um, and they are an amazing example of how it, you know, indigenous ran land back, you know, land based, I should say, um, programs can be because they operate outside the colonial system. It's, it's almost sovereign in that sense, right? But what is interesting is, so uh, this was back, uh, I believe to, uh, last winter, um, the original site for this um, winter response was at a golf course, which was subject to arson which is an act of colonial violence, but um, you know, we were then put into an old building at the hospital. And one thing we had to work around was smudging, um, you know, burning sage um, for medicine within the hospital, like we had to work around the parameters of that. And it really wasn't an issue. Um, it's, always, it's always an issue with buildings because there's a sense that there will be a fire or that will trip the alarms, which it won't. The only time it did trip an alarm is when our firekeeper had a smudge billowing, <laughs> um, you know, but if you're lighting a few pieces of sage um, for a smudge, it won't cause a fire, right? So that's just like a very simple example of like policy that we have to like look at, I guess, or like um, that we are challenged with, um, but it, it, it was really inspirational to see um, everything else ran like how it was ought to be run. You know, we are working on like the original laws and like um, we're going through the grandfather teachings and like the medicine wheel teachings and all these different things, right? So um, yeah, it, it's interesting to see like colonial system versus like, I guess, indigenous systems and um, how they contrast, yeah. Does that help with your question? I just want to add to that, and I know uh, from Danica reaching out to our services that residence is, is a really, really big barrier as well. There are limited spaces in residence, and we know that working in this sector, but when you have uh, students that are um, so far away that leave the area that you're going, that you that your um, college or your university is located in, and they're traveling five, ten hours away, uh, not being able to live in residence is a huge barrier, so I know that it's important to look at designating spots for uh, Indigenous learners and marginalized learners in those spaces. And I just wanted to add that. I think we are at time. I'm, I'm getting a wave. <laughs> oh, OK. I'm sorry. Thank you. I OK, Jonathan. Yes. Oh, yes. No, thank you so much. I wasn't sure if I should raise my little brown hand there or, or just uh, wait. <laughs> um, really great points, Josh. Uh, I really like Josh's response there. Um, smudge, the smudging policy is exactly what I want to talk about right there. Um, we, we, we know how our medicines are interacting with us as learners or us as Indigenous people, us as people in general. Um, I almost want to tie that into my last response too, is just having that access to medicines too. And for our learners um, that are doing hybrid is from the institution perspective is taking that additional step to understand their, their students, understand their learners. If they are indigenous, hey, well, maybe they can get connected with a local resource in that community that they're from. Um, I may, like for example, um, I take university through Laurentian at Sudbury. I'm not from Sudbury. However, maybe if the professor knew that I was from the Sault Ste. Marie region, um, maybe experiencing some difficulty, they can connect me with the Indigenous Friendship Center here or Sioux College or Nogda Winneman. So for here at Nogda Winneman, um, I am one of the uh, communication managers here in senior management. And um, 
we face this as an institution, as an agency ourselves with the uh, access to smudging. Um, some of our buildings, some of our office spaces, we're, we're physically not allowed to smudge because of the ventilation system. It's not adequate enough. So we're, we have to give the, the spray smudge. <laughs> and I don't know about you, but I don't know how sacred you feel after a little spray smudge. <laughs> but I will leave you with, it is the, it is the, the act of willingness to, to open that mind and that act of willingness from the institution itself. Um, I have a wonderful opportunity. I do come from Sioux College. Uh, that is where my roots had begun. Um, I have the amazing opportunity to sit on as their chair for their Indigenous education uh, circle, um, as well as one of the Board of Governors, the Indigenous representative for the Board of Governors. So I have that direct link on in, in uh, influence in policy change and putting recommendations forward from that Indigenous perspective. And that is absolutely one thing that I'm absolutely pushing for is that continued support for our medicines being accessible for all students, especially prior to exams or, or midterms. Um, and even when it comes to convocation of wearing ceremony items, walking down across the stage to get your diploma, you've worked very, very, very hard for. Um, let's be proud of our accomplishments and let's wear what we need to wear to, to feel sacred and to feel accomplished and, and uh, proud of who we are. And um, for the institution perspective is, again, similar to the comment I made earlier, is getting uncomfortable asking those very uncomfortable questions. You have a ton of resources in your local areas, all 24 colleges, and I'm talking from the college perspective, all 24 colleges come with, uh, are located in some very rich locations with some really rich knowledge and history uh, and great uh, knowledge keepers in their area. So reach out, be uncomfortable and, uh, and learn because uh, we're all in this together. So miigwech. Thank you so much. <laughs> I, I, I want to share and I'll do one more question. Um, Indigenous education councils, all the colleges are mandated to have one and that is a great resource. Uh, people like Jonathan have sat on those councils. We have a good representation, a mix of internal and external partners on those councils and being able to utilize them to help us uh, do this work and work through policy, policy change. So thank you. Are there any more questions for our students before we wrap up our panel today? Thank you. Um, Nick Baker from the uh, University of Windsor. One of the challenges that we're facing, um, it, I work in, with a lot of technology and uh, helping facilitate this kind of thing. One of the questions that we uh, have been grappling with as an industry is that all of these systems are colonial in design and nature, but there's very few people who understand how to decolonize a piece of technology. Mm. So could you speak a little bit to your experience with trying to use these technologies and how they interact with you, how they make you feel and what can we do to make those more welcoming spaces? That's a good question. Okay. Tech, we're talking tech now and uh, how do we, uh, and I remember when, when uh, land acknowledgements came out on signatures that people, um, some of the the zoom platforms they use us servers so where how are you acknowledging that time and space so that that's a great question do any of our uh, student learners want to take uh, an opportunity at that one talking tech all right I'll raise my hand i'm just going to go ahead and start speaking sorry okay. <laughs> go jonathan <laughs> um this is a very interesting question in particular to land acknowledgements i absolutely please don't lean on us as indigenous learners to answer that question. I want you as the, whether it's the settler or just the uh, professor or the, the lead of the, the classroom to do that knowledge and that research self uh, uh, with yourself. And don't be afraid to, to have it wrong. Don't be afraid to say, you know what? I got this information from this source. Is it correct? Is it not? And show me in that good way, teach me in that good way where I should be accessing that resource and that knowledge. Um, for for me, it, it it's uh, I had a really hard time with land acknowledgements and, and offering land acknowledgements, um, not in the fact that it's not important that we're not acknowledging our land. It is absolutely important. But why am I acknowledging that I'm on my own territory? Mm -hmm. um, 
and and I say that with the utmost respect and, and good intention and good heart, but I want our allies and our settlers to know where they're situated on too and what the difference is between Treaty 7 and, and Treaty 9 and, and Robinson here on Treaty Territory. Um, I work for an in Indigenous Child Welfare Agency that is within one treaty territory. However, our sister agency has three treaty territories that they work in. So they need to understand the protocols and the understanding and the, and the community protocols that goes along with those traditional territories as well. So I would always encourage, and, and I'll leave you with this, is to ask the individuals that is coming to us for uh, land acknowledgements to do that work themselves, research and get vulnerable through themselves and learn in that good way and surround yourselves with people that will teach you in that good way. And secondly, be mindful of how, what that, that rich history and what that rich um, land had to offer and incorporate that into your land acknowledgement. So for me, we are situated on the Robertson Huron Treaty territory uh, in, in Sault Ste. Marie. Um, but what I also know, what I've also come to learn is this is also a huge Métis settlement as well. I didn't know that. For, for many, many years. And uh, so that's something that I've learned as I'm developing my own land acknowledgements for various um, events and stuff. But uh, that's what I wanna leave with for, for those pieces. Thank you. I think we we um, sort of landed on the land acknowledgement as a, far, a part of the tech question there. I think it is it is something worth exploring or maybe thinking about. It's a, it's an important question. And uh, sorry, maybe you didn't get exactly uh, the, the Oh, I, I do have something yeah. To add, okay. Yeah. Because I really like um, what you said. But um, I think another part of that is it's a long term investment, if you will. Um, so, you know, if you're having challenges of like how to decolonize uh, tech, right? Um, hire Indigenous people. I mean, there's a barrier to that, right? Because how many Indigenous people are going into tech, right? But, um, you know, I, I'll think of um, any hello. They're a uh, Indigenous marketplace and stack market. And what I really like there, so Chelsea, she runs the shop. Um, she's the owner. She talks about uh, indigenomics, um, kind of like economics, but indigenized, right? And it's kind of outside of the colonial realm, but it's still there. So what I would say is um, invest in like indigenous economies, um, whether it be tech or um, business, things like that, because that's how you'll eventually get to that point. And also to add, you know, as settlers, right, um, don't be afraid of messing up, like do your research, ask questions, um, but don't be like afraid, I guess. And I know that's a challenge, right? Because sometimes you're like, oh, am I going to get canceled or am I going to feel like ostracized? No, it just depends on your intention, right? If you have good intention and you apologize if you made a mistake, smooth sailing, right? But you have to be knowing like why you're asking that question, like what's the intention of it, right? So I just wanted to add that, but I think it's good to invest in like um, indigenous people in the industry. That's a really good answer. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Hi, or some indigenous folks, um, student learners. I know a lot of us have work study programs. Those are amazing. We get such great, great talent from those programs that we have in our institutions. So I know we have went over your time. I want to thank everyone so much for being so engaged with our, our speakers today.